This week we're going to focus on the cost of information and how we can make sure that we are using information resources legally. This presentation is going to be split into two parts. In this one we'll be talking about how much information can cost, how the library works to get what you need, and the open access movement. The next presentation will look at copyright and fair use. This is an apt picture because navigating these issues can be like walking a tightrope, one that has expensive and legal consequences if you don't get it right. These are the areas we're going to cover this week. Very exciting, right? While these might not be the most thrilling subjects to study, it is important you know how to use information correctly and legally. To be honest, issues of journal prices, database licenses, and copyright give even librarians a headache. You may think that you don't have to worry about issues of copyright and how much journals cost, but it does impact you as a student. You may get frustrated when you find that the library doesn't own a certain journal when you absolutely need an article for your research. I swear, it's not because we're trying to ruin your chances for getting a good grade. We just can't buy everything. You may experience an issue when you try to log into a database and it won't let you in. The license may be restricting the amount of users or it may not allow access from off campus. We will also touch upon the open access movement which matters as the push for freely available resources can make your research easier even when you're no longer a student. Ooh, a graph, how exciting! This is just a visual guide so you can compare how much libraries spend on journals, what we sometimes call serials in library land. You can't quite see it, but the light gray line represents the consumer price index, which is related to how much the prices of other items increase over time. It's very easy to see that journals, the red line, is way above that. Some journal prices have increased 145% in less than 10 years. Just this month, one of the pharmacy journals which the library subscribes to increased its price 177% from just one year to the next. It's just crazy. While journal prices go up and up, the library budget is going down or it's flat. That is a problem. If libraries want to be able to keep the journals we have, we end up cutting back on books and other services or canceling subscriptions to journals altogether. And it's not just small libraries that are feeling the pinch. As one of your readings this week will show, even Harvard University, one of the wealthiest universities in the world, cannot afford what journals are charging. So, why are journals so expensive for libraries? The short answer is that we pay for everyone on campus to have access. This makes things much more costly than a subscription for just one person. Also, publishers have been able to continue to charge more and more so they may not have any reason to stop while libraries still pay up. But there's always more to it. Here's another reason for the wild price increases. First, I'm no economics expert, but even I know that less competition there is in the market the more businesses can charge for their product. This is what happened as the big publishers have bought up the smaller places. Yes, this is another exciting chart, but what it says is very important. It says that more than 60 publishers are now controlled by just six companies. That is not a lot of competition. Also, there are more and more articles published each year, and this has led to the creation of specialty journals which can charge more for their product because they know that those interested in that area really want that information. Finally, there's publish or perish. Ever heard of it? Probably, especially if you've been in college for a while or have family or friends who've been in college or work for a university. Faculty have to do research and publish papers in order to get tenure. They get more points for papers published in peer-reviewed journals and more prestige from papers published in what are termed high-impact journals. These are journals that are cited a lot. These journals know that they're popular so they can charge more knowing that libraries will have to pay. So. While I may be able to get a personal subscription to Entertainment Weekly for around $25 a year, the library is going to pay about $10,000 a year for the specialty journal Biochemical Pharmacology. It's a little bit crazy. So you think $10,000 for a journal is expensive? You might want to sit down before hearing about database prices. First, what do we mean when we talk about databases? Well, a database is online sources that can provide information access to journal articles, newspapers, and other specialized information. 
You might be familiar with the EBSCO database from searching it in high school or using it for a different college class. Using a database usually allows you to search many journals and other sources all at once, which can really save time. And many of our databases provide a copy of the PDF article as well. Most databases are specialized, so we have some for nursing, economics, art, dance, and more. This specialization makes it easier to find information specific to what you need. But that convenience comes with a price. Database subscriptions are a pretty big chunk of every library's budget, with some going for more than $50,000 or more each year. And though inflation isn't as bad as it is with journals, the prices are still going up. And just like with journals, we don't have a personal vendetta against you if we don't have or end up canceling your favorite database. We just can't afford it all. Okay, now let's talk briefly about licensing. No, not a driver's license or a fishing license. Those are fun at least. This licensing has to do with paying for databases and for providing access to online books and similar information. A license is something that's paid every year to make sure we have continued access to a resource, usually an ebook or a database. This is compared to buying a print copy of something and owning it forever. All of the library databases are purchased this way, so if a database gets canceled or cut out of the budget, we lose access to it completely. It doesn't matter if we've been paying for it for a decade. The information is locked away if you don't pay. The rules for using the information in a database or other licensed resource vary widely. Some of these allow ISU faculty, staff, and students to use the resources both on and off campus. Some databases are only available to certain groups, like the pharmacy school. And some resources can only be used within the Pocatello Library. All these little details may make the lawyers very happy, but it gives the rest of us a major headache. Like journals, databases tend to increase their prices by quite a bit every year just because they know that librarians, students, and faculty have come to depend on and use the information. So if it's so much trouble, why bother? The information you can find, including full text articles, cannot be duplicated using a free search tool like Google. Most of the library databases are just too valuable to the research process to give up. Many researchers publish articles in order to promote knowledge and further enhance their subject area, not because they're looking to get rich. Most journal authors don't get paid anything, so it can be quite annoying when what they publish is restricted to only those who can afford to pay for the journal. So, many started to look for a new way to publish where what they wrote could be freely accessible to all. This is called open access. It's no coincidence that the field of open access journals started up about the same time that journal prices started going nuts. It was a direct reaction to what many researchers, scientists, and librarians felt were unfair practices and prices from the big publishers. In 1990, a group of 34,000 scholars wrote something called an open letter to scientific publishers that requested what they called an online public library that would offer free access to the world's research. When that had no impact on the big publishers, no surprise there, they formed the Public Library of Science and started publishing the journal PLOS as an open access journal in 2003. Just like everything, including traditional journals, there's a wide range in the quality of open access journals out there. So, how is open access different than traditional publishing other than the cost of the journal? In traditional publishing, the journal makes its money by charging the readers and libraries. In open access, the journal makes its money by charging the authors when they submit their articles. That's not a bad system if the author has the financial backing of a university or a grant, but it can hurt those who can't come up with a submission fee, which ranges from anywhere from $1,000 to $3,000 an article. And this isn't the only method, though. If you ever decide to look more deeply into open access, you'll see references to gold and green routes. These are simply different ways to make sure the article or other material is made freely available. So as a review, this week is designed to make you aware that libraries are struggling with ever-increasing journal prices and that our database licensing is also pricey and frustrating. This has a direct impact on you because the more things cost, the more that we have to cut, as library budgets are not unlimited. 
Open access is a relatively new and exciting way of making information available to all by transferring the cost of the creators of the research versus the readers. I know this isn't the most exciting information to cover, but you definitely know more about the budgets and struggles of a library now. We hope you come to appreciate the value of what you have access to as an ISU student and how using library resources for research can be a better bet than just a Google search. Okay, here are the assignments you'll be expected to complete by the end of this week. There are two presentations this week, the one you've just watched, and the next one which covers issues of copyright and fair use. There's also a few short readings within the Week 3 section on Moodle. Make sure you post to the discussion forum and respond to the post of at least one of your classmates. The quiz this week will be 10 questions which will come from these presentations and the readings. The quiz is open note, so feel free to review the materials if needed.